Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the second of this year's Asia Trends Lectures, brought to you by the Asia Research Institute, ARI or ARI, uh, in collaboration with the National Library of Singapore, uh, whom we have to thank in particular for providing us with this, uh, this wonderful uh, venue. My name is Tim Bunnell, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you two speakers, um, Professor Peter Newman and Dr. Paul Barter, who are eminently qualified to speak to this topic of green urbanism. Before I go on to introduce the two speakers properly, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about ARI, the Asia Trend Series, and also the research cluster which organized tonight's event. The Asia Research Institute was established as a university level institute at the National University of Singapore in July 2001. Its mission is to provide a world-class focus and resource for research on the Asian region. This includes research across the social sciences, with a particular emphasis on interdisciplinary frontiers between and beyond disciplines. These transdisciplinary research activities are conducted in six main research clusters. The changing family in Asia, Asian migration, religion and globalization in Asian contexts, cultural studies in Asia, science, technology and society, and last but not least, um, Asian urbanisms. And tonight's Asia Trends Lecture is brought to you by the Asian Urbanisms Cluster. Asia Trends is ARI's flagship public outreach event, and 2010 is the eighth consecutive year that it's taken place. The format this year is for each of the research clusters to organize a public lecture event. Leading international academic figures are being brought in, and we've also asked locally based scholars to provide short commentaries. Two weeks ago, Associate Professor C. Julia Huang from National Tsinghua University in Taiwan gave the first of this year's lectures on the topic of religion-based NGOs as part of the Religion and Globalization Cluster. Tonight, as I've said, it's the turn of the Asian Urbanisms Cluster. Until very recently, the cluster was called Sustainable Cities, and of course the topic of tonight's lecture would have fitted that very well. The rationale for renaming and reframing the cluster was to open it up to avenues of research beyond issues of sustainability, and also so as not to duplicate the interests of the successful Centre for Sustainable Asian Cities in the School of Design and Environment. However, urban sustainability is certainly still among the expanded range of urban research interests in the new Asian Urbanisms Cluster. So, I am indeed uh, delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, Professor Peter Newman will be speaking to the title of Green Urbanism, How Does Singapore Compare? And then Dr. Paul Barta from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy will provide comments and discussion drawing in particular on his uh, knowledge of the local scene. So, without further ado, um, Peter Newman. Professor, uh, Peter Newman is Professor of Sustainability at Curtin University and was recently a visiting professor um, in architecture at NUS. He is on the board of Infrastructure Australia that is funding infrastructure for the long-term sustainability of Australian cities. He has two co-authored books that were published in 2009 alone, um, Resilient Cities, Responding to Peak Oil and Climate Change, and Green Urbanism Down Under. Peter is well known for having invented the term automobile dependence, which is now an established part of much planning, practice, and theory. Peter's book with Jeff Kenworthy, Sustainability in Cities, Overcoming Automobile Dependence, was launched in the White House in 1999. Between 1976 and 1980, Peter was a local government councillor in the city of Fremantle, where he still lives today. Peter is very much a public intellectual, and 
So I think an ideal person to be delivering tonight's Asia Trends Lecture. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Peter Yu. That's not a disaster. 
we have been through these changes before. And we go through innovation cycles. And they often come out of periods of collapse, of uh, recession or depression. And the change into, from the 1930s was a period of uh, enormous uh, despair at the time, but out of it came the era we've just lived through. Uh, but we have to see that that era is changing and that we now have an era based on smart technologies and sustainable technologies which are reshaping our cities. And what kind of future is emerging, that is the uh, topic that we're looking at tonight. Because green urbanism is the future, it's not a mind, a, you know, a one to the side anymore. It is uh, right in the centre. So what it means, uh, we have set out in this book, is, is these seven kinds of cities. The renewable energy city, the carbon neutral city, distributed city, biophilic city, eco-efficient city, place-based city and sustainable transport city. And each of them combine these new technologies. And I'm going to quickly go through each of these city types, give you some best practice examples that are emerging, and see what it means in Singapore. So the renewable energy city is uh, one that is clearly building itself around renewable energy. And some cities are doing this quite quickly. Uh, a number of cities in China are now heading down the track, but the uh, in, in Australia, Adelaide has done more than others. It's up to about 20% now. And it can happen quite quickly. But Europe is clearly the leader here. Uh, it's not as though they've got more sun than anyone else. Um, they actually have just committed themselves to it. The political process has enabled this change. And there are cities emerging that are 100% renewable, like Vauban and Freiburg. And they are cities that are also very low carbon in terms of their transport uh, with light rail and bikes, uh, streets that are mainly full of children doing artworks rather than cars, and uh, lots of the new technologies. It is, I think, uh, a model of how a city can be better and at the same time have a reduced footprint. Those kind of examples you can find all over the place in Europe. They have made a commitment in the last decade to move down this track. We've got a few examples emerging. This is a proposal in Perth for a zero carbon development for 10,000 dwellings. Uh, in San Francisco Bay, Treasure Island is going to have a similar, about 20,000 residents and, and lots of new offices and so on, which will be zero carbon. Uh, I went to Mazda in January. It's a, uh, a new um, zero carbon city emerging in Abu Dhabi. I think a, a very brave experiment. It's, it's one that uh, you could only do with a lot of money, but it is nevertheless one that uh, is being built. Uh, it's not just sit, sitting around waiting for others to do it. And it's um, taking traditional Arabic design and, and with narrow streets and medium densities uh, creating uh, a new kind of city. It's uh, Norman Foster designs everywhere, extraordinary uh, architecture with these solar chimneys and, and, uh, and wonderful designs. Um, in America, there are other examples emerging. This is Google's headquarters, um, covered in photovoltaics, only with electric vehicles, and they're trying to show that they can be cool and green. The photovoltaic industry is dramatically increasing. 40% a year, I don't know any other industry growing quite so dramatically, and that's for the last 15 years. So they had a little bit of a downturn last year, I think they dropped to 12 or something. But it is a, uh, a pretty good thing to back. Uh, there are a number of other small-scale technologies emerging, like these wind pods, which are actually coming out of uh, my hometown and are being sold into China at the moment. They go on the ridge cap buildings. Uh, so they can be generating power within the city. The big question that's always hung over the renewables is how do you store it? Because it fluctuates, and I'll come back to that. 
What about Singapore? I went to Ubin, the uh, solar island. Uh, there are places that are being set up as demonstrations. Uh, a number of the new housing estates, Biopolis. Um, so there is, there is some sign of uh, recognition of this developing uh, need. Uh, solar is growing. It's not got any kind of uh, subsidy. Um, and there are some money going into some demonstrations. Two shopping centres are going solar. Uh, the photovoltaic industry is locating itself here in this region. Um, but I think it does need a goal. The places in Germany that have actually gone, gone somewhere, uh, places like Germany that have gone somewhere have been based around a clear goal like 20% renewable by 2020, which is the Australian government goal, and that is completely reshaping the, the utility industry now, because to achieve it, the only way would be to build nothing else but renewables for the next decade. Um, and there does need to be a cooperative process. It's not like Singapore can do this alone, because it is uh, a regional issue, and there are a number of examples now of uh, ways in which you can get pipelines and high voltage DC power lines across a region. Uh, there's a group called Desert Tech who's looking at how they can link uh, Northern Africa into Europe and in the same way how uh, regional renewables can be linked right across Asia. Those are being put together and the ADB are supporting that dream here. The second city is the carbon neutral city, which is where cities make a commitment to being carbon neutral in the same way that a number of businesses are doing that. And if one of the key outcomes uh, is the offsetting process, where you can actually help rebuild and regenerate the ecosystem around. Um, and the, the renewal process of uh, landscapes it is underway in some places, fed by this need to demonstrate carbon neutral um, status. They can be fully accredited. We have a, a now what's called a carbon management authority. Uh, in the UK it's called a carbon trust. And that's how you get uh, official recognition that what you are doing is carbon neutral. And it is a process that um, governments, agencies and uh, businesses can do. We're rebuilding a whole area right across our state, 2,000 kilometres long, uh, which will help uh, to regenerate those ecosystems for the uh, long-term future. And that's all being done with carbon offsets. In the UK, they have made a very strong commitment to this. They have said all urban development will be carbon neutral from 2016. And they've got about 30 demonstrations now of how to do it. Uh, this was the first one, Bed said. And it's, uh, it's quite a serious uh, matter to, to come to terms with that. Uh, that would be very interesting if Singapore suddenly said all urban development will be carbon neutral. How do you do it? You would have to involve some offsets in that process, and that's okay. And for 20 or 30 years, those offsets could go into rebuilding the bioregion. Malmo is uh, the first carbon neutral city in, this is a city in Sweden. And in Singapore, there is of course a lot of greening happening. It'd be interesting to see how much carbon that is offsetting already. Uh, but the big thing is, is Malaysia and Indonesia and the, the rainforest that could be regenerated through uh, carbon neutral uh, projects. There are mechanisms, global mechanisms, to encourage that, but it could be done through the Singapore government having uh, the accreditation process that enables that to occur. Uh, it is like uh, a, uh, a stock exchange in many ways. You can have a carbon management authority to help lead that and show leadership in the region. There are some 
businesses here that are carbon neutral and a whole chain of hotels and resorts called Alia that are carbon neutral. Uh, they put their money into offsetting uh, projects in the region. Uh, the students thought maybe the whole CBD could go carbon neutral or the port could go carbon neutral and demonstrate to the world how a, uh, a whole transport system could be made carbon neutral and based on uh, bunker oil being replaced with biofuels. Uh, that's the kind of big thinking that can establish leadership in the region. Biophilic city is emerging as a um, uh, key area to uh, bring sustainability, to bring green urbanism in. This is the real green part of it because um, it, it is literally greening the city. It's about doing it locally. And it started really with the uh, uh, green roofs movement in Chicago as, as a way of uh, reducing the urban heat island effect. And uh, the Dean today showed me around in US where some projects are happening where you are actually measuring that and, and have clear programs to, to demonstrate how the urban heat island effect can be reduced uh, by planting. And green roofs, there's over 400 now in Chicago. Toronto requires every new commercial building to have a green roof. Um, and even doing it in places like Dearborn, Michigan, where Ford Motor Works has been had a green roof put on it, and, and uh, bird life is now nesting there. Uh, it's also often to do with water, and the whole idea that water in the city can be brought back into the system and, and, and made uh, part of the ecosystem is is a big idea in the biophilic city concept. This. Um, Freeway in Seoul uh, has been dismantled and turned into a, an amazing uh, urban regeneration project that's regenerated the river that was under it uh, and created a, a park for people that is very, very popular. The mayor who was elected uh, on the basis that he would do that happened to be the engineer who had built the freeway. Extraordinarily. <laughs> And uh, he's now the president of Korea, so it hasn't harmed his, his career. Um, so the uh, enlivening of waterways, taking this modernist kind of idea of turning a creek into a drain, a stormwater drain with concrete, which uh, engineers did for some time, and making it a, an attractive uh, urban ecosystem that still works in terms of stormwater is happening everywhere. And this kind of greening is especially important in a high density city. And these kind of uh, small parks and the greening that's happening in Singapore is, is extremely important. The students were able to document for me all the different plans that have been uh, put into place now, the streetscape greenery master plan. And the, when you look down on the Singapore, like we do tonight, you can see the, uh, the kind of uh, greening that's happening and the corridors that are emerging and the way in which new buildings are uh, having more and more greenery. Down their walls on their top, uh, along balconies and the Port Park demonstration area, which uh, I've yet to visit, but which uh, I'm looking forward to because that seems to be setting a, a whole new dimension to architecture. The subsidies that are provided and the new developments that are emerging, even the, uh, the vertical greening that's now something you can see, the guidelines that are provided, the water sensitive urban design, uh, many examples that are, are, are now beginning. Um, there are questions about how much food you can produce in a city like Singapore. This is a concept from uh, Bill McDonough on what a Chinese city could be. He called it Paddy on top and Barcelona below. Uh, it, it is a drawing. Um, so there is uh, urban greening occurring in 
Singapore quite dramatically. Um, it is uh, emerging as a, as a way to, to drape the city in greenery, uh, to move from the garden city to the city in the garden. And I don't know any other city that's gone as far down this track. Uh, it is a city that I would bring people to and say, see what is now happening here. And it happens pretty quickly. And it, I, I would expect that in 10 years you'll, you'll see quite dramatic changes uh, looking from a, a view like this. It, it, it should become, uh, I think, the model biophilic city in Asia. And certainly all the designs, all the, the pictures of the future urban development is more and more green. The distributed city is where we're talking about infrastructure for water, energy and waste. And it is an um, emerging area that is quite different. Up until now, the last 50 years, we've built more and more centralised systems. And the new technologies are small scale and they operate much better at a small scale. And they are emerging. The Sydney, city of Sydney is, is trying to uh, demonstrate this in what they call their green transformers. But it is really about the polycentric city. The city can be now divided up into centres and these can be largely self-sufficient in many ways, not just in transport, the, the area that Paul and I have worked in, but the, uh, in terms of the other infrastructure. So in just about every new city, whether it's Mazda or Dongtan or Tianjin, the new green cities have this distributed infrastructure. They are small scale. If you want 100% renewable, this is the way you do it. You, you, you do it in, in uh, these localised energy, water and waste systems. Uh, there are a few small examples around of regenerating a city like Cogra in Sydney is a green transit oriented development uh, with all of the, the new technologies in it. Um, but what I'm finding really interesting, even in the last six months since I was um, here, the number of new projects that are coming up, almost every new project on the drawing boards in Australia wants to do this new kind of distributed infrastructure. The new Barangaroo development a major part of Darling Harbour. It's the new, it's going to have 20,000 dwellings there. And they, when they put it together, they didn't require that, but all of the submissions were for 100% uh, renewable, zero scheme water, zero waste development. The one I'm working on this green infrastructure study in the Stirling City Centre is very interesting proposal because the city council is very keen on it and what you find is that the centralised authorities for energy and water and waste that you expect to sort of react to it saying, no we like this idea because you can come in and do your development and we'll link it in but we don't need to increase the size of our main sewer or our main drain or our main water supply link or in any new substations you just link in, we're a more resilient city because we can help each other, but we're quite happy to start subdividing the city up in this way. Now that to me is a real breakthrough. I thought there would be a lot bigger uh, obstacles, there probably still are, but we're, we're going through that at the moment. And the first detailed cost-benefit analysis has come out on one of these called Armstrong Creek, and it showed eight, $500 million net present value savings in infrastructure over 10 years by doing this approach. So I think it's unstoppable, this movement, the small scale uh, green infrastructure. Um, in Singapore, the water system is being divided up now into these small areas and even out uh, here the extraordinary thing of having an urban uh, water reservoir uh, right in the CBD. Uh, I don't know any other city that's done that yet. But you do have 22 sub-centres and each of them 
is reasonably self-sufficient. It has a number of things that are there in terms of schools and hospital facilities and so on, social infrastructure. Why not this green infrastructure? It, and and it, it can enable the city over a period of decades to, uh, to demonstrate this and, and to become more and more green. So polycentric city works well. Uh, I think it can be extended to this new infrastructure. Interestingly, Singapore, which designed Tianjin, the eco city there, did it with small scale distributed infrastructure. But there's no doubt you need good communication systems to make this work. You can't do the sustainable green technologies unless you've got the smart stuff to, to help with the control systems. And you've got that. So that's uh, a very good base to work from. The fifth city is the eco-efficient city. This is really about industry and how it, it can play a part in this. Uh, they talk about factor four, even factor 10 efficiency. Extraordinary efficiencies, and also the other main idea is industrial ecology. There are cities that are demonstrating it. Hammersby Showstad in Stockholm is is one of these uh, these demonstrations. You can go and see that today. Uh, but there are industrial estates also that are demonstrating this idea of industrial ecology. It, it's a way in which you get the waste from one industry shared as the resources for another and, uh, and, and great efficiencies introduced. It's more like an ecosystem. There are 180 resource exchanges occurring in the Konana industrial uh, area. When I, I went to work in the state government for a while uh, on a sustainability strategy, I had no idea. I thought Konana was just a dirty old industrial area. But it's extraordinary how the in industrial players had got together because the local community demanded some improvements and they started to find they had all kinds of things in common and they work together, they collaborate, they don't just compete and uh, that, that is uh, I think the era that we are moving into. You have to do this. Um, and Singapore has already done this in the water system. It's, it's got an extraordinary eco-efficiencies there. The construction industry here is also a model. The students were able to show me how uh, extraordinary is the recycling rates that are now happening. Um, it helps not to have sand and things like that uh, available if you, if you are driven into it. Jurong is, is looking to, to move down this industrial ecology path. Uh, NUS have done some work about how industrial ecology and landscape ecology can be linked. And, uh, but these, um, these have got a way to go. There's a, industry has, has been set the goal, as the rest of Singapore has, of reaching 16% reductions in greenhouse gas by 2020. Uh, I haven't seen a plan yet that will show how that will happen. Uh, there will need to be these kind of changes. Two to go. Place-based cities is the, um, the way in which identity and uh, place stories are uh, integrated into the city. This is the human dimension of green urbanism. It's how we generate uh, a sense of belonging and therefore local economies which are very important for the long-term future. And it is about the place stories that we, uh, we, we tell about our cities. So every city has a story, and I tell the story of my own hometown here in Fremantle, um, the redevelopment of this site, which was a waste site, and because it was a sacred site for two cultures, uh, and how the story is told, the indigenous story along with the white story, um, and uh, on, on a piece of public sculpture. A lot of storytelling goes around the redevelopment of sites like this, um, where the river was opened up in Orvis. Uh, a lot of local food uh, projects are about rediscovering place with markets. I asked the students, what did you think about Singapore and its uh, identity? And uh, they were all very positive about the way in which the identity is built into cultural, natural, and built heritage. 
And that movement is, is alive and well here uh, in the nar natural uh, uh, heritage and park connector network um, and in the public housing and social spaces, uh, the markets that are alive and well in every place. So identity and place are obviously high on the agenda here. Um, the goal of the cultural city of Asia is there. Maybe it can now be integrated into the idea of the sustainable city of Asia. Um, so finally, the sustainable transport city. And this is about reducing VKT, that's car use, vehicle kilometres travelled, uh, and a growing quality transit system. It's about building the city around that transit system. It's about facilitating pedestrians and cycling. It's about building renewable transport around plug-in electric vehicles. Those are the four themes that we talked about and which I have been collecting data on for many years. And if you look at this, um, this is the American cities. That's Atlanta there around about the 100 gigajoules per capita Singapore is around the 10 mark, uh, yes, Perth is around 35, um, and the European cities in between around 20. The emerging cities of Asia, uh, Singapore, Chinese and Indian cities around 2. Enormous variation in transport fuel use and per capita, and uh, Singapore is, is certainly low in a global sense. Um, if you look at the public transport, um, it, it's, it's not the best in the world, but it's up there, it's certainly a lot better than European cities, and in terms of the cities of America, the, the black there, some of them are almost on, on, on the zero mark, and uh, a long way to go. You can see how vulnerable they are in terms of peak oil. And density is very much related to this see that the dense cities of Asia are here. Uh, here's Singapore around the 100 mark. Most of the eight European cities around 50 and our cities in Australia around the 20 mark. Atlanta, that I mentioned, the 100 uh, gigajoules per capita, is six people per hectare. It's almost not a city, it's so scattered. Uh, it's just sprawl up sprawl and Perth is not a great deal better, but um, at least we're, we're double that. Um, and the, the reason why we need to get people out of cars is that it simply saves space in the city. You can have that many people in cars going to three buses or one light rail. And you save space, you save money, you save greenhouse gases. Um, and it's all about making transit work effectively. And Singapore is here in terms of the speed of public transport over traffic. Now, that was 1995 data, and we've got brand new data on, that's taken us up to 2005. Um, it takes ages to get this data. Jeff <coughs> Kenworth is working away in Germany on this. Um, so, just very quickly, where do we stand? In density terms, interestingly, most of the cities of the world are going up in density. After 50 years of declining, they're going up. And Singapore went down. Uh, now, why is that? Because you're getting higher, higher rise uh, in, in the uh, government buildings, in the uh, HDB. Uh, but it seems to me that perhaps there has been uh, a uh, a ra rather more rapid increase in lower density housing as well. Uh, it's not a big drop though. I mean, you're still a high density city. You certainly are not heading towards Atlanta. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a small drop and one to be uh, careful about. The length of freeway, it's, uh, the, the freeway era is ending and more and more examples of that are found around the world. Um, the, in Singapore, it's slightly dropped on the capital level. Um, parking everywhere, people are recognising that we should not be putting in more parking and it is dropping. Uh, provision of public transport, 
is going up everywhere, and apart from in the Australian cities. But in Perth, uh, we did put in a, um, a whole new transit system, and I'd love to be able to show these pictures because uh, it was quite a struggle to get, and we, uh, we have, we, we're quite proud now of this new transit system, which is working extremely well. Uh, and the rest of Australia is trying to catch up now. The, uh, the ratio of transit to, to traffic speeds are uh, rather mixed. Uh, in Singapore it's gone up and the, uh, uh, perhaps as the MRT is expanding and the uh, traffic is slowing down as you get more cars on the road, uh, but you see the dramatic increase there in the European cities where they are just building transit systems now and expanding them. Um, then the actual boardings, the, the, the uh, increases in public transport are going up everywhere. Now, unfortunately, Singapore didn't go up um, in that period. Now, it, it, it was a bit of a struggle for us to understand that because you are opening up new lines, but the data were quite revealing. Um, basically, it's due to bus reductions. There are 11% less bus seat kilom kilometres available now on a per capita basis uh, than in the previous 10 years. Um, in many ways, it's a rapid growth in population. It's hard to keep up, to keep providing that infrastructure. Um, but it is a very interesting trend that cities around the world are going up quite dramatically in public transport, especially in America, after years of decline. And I'll show you a bit more on that in a second. Um, so the actual boarding is there. Um, rail is up 45% and bus is down 29% in terms of the uh, Singapore experience. So, um, it's something to watch. Uh, the MRT is being expanded. You've got new lines coming in and they will definitely be needed. Uh, but the buses to meet them, I'm sure you all experience this. Um, they're not uh, as efficient and effective. Uh, and perhaps it's time to begin to subsidise them. You're one of the few cities in the world that doesn't. The, uh, in the end, the litmus test is what happens to um, car use, and I think it's extraordinary to see that car use is beginning um, to, to drop in a few places, but it is really plateauing in the US cities. Um, it, it did go, uh, go up a very little bit in Singapore. But interestingly, the last five years, since that 2005 data, we've got some data on Australia and US cities showing this pattern. Car use per capita is on decline. Now that's a very different world. Once that starts to set in, and this happened before the GFC and the fuel price and so on, there is a, a new structural trend emerging. Younger people are going back into the cities. They're not too interested in that far distant suburbs. It is a, um, a different era. Transit's going up, car use is going down. So all of the transit systems, especially light rail, dramatically increased 7% in, in uh, one year and uh, a 4% decline in car use. That is a very different world because it means you can start to take out road space rather than having to accommodate more and more cars. I think we are over cars in some of these cities now. At least over car dependence. Same in Australia, look at that. I didn't have this uh, data here when I was back in January, but car use per capita going down. Very different world. And public transport going up dramatically. Perth led the way, the other cities are starting to follow. Sydney's got a long way to go. Uh, 
uh, and we're helping to fund that uh, now, but it is a, uh, a different world. So, um, fuel, transport fuel, because of the efficiencies that are beginning to emerge, generally going down, it did go down in Singapore. And the final data was on traffic accidents, which are going down across the world. So, the other side of this is making cities more walkable. This is what Paul works on and, and more bikeable and bicycle friendly. Um, this is part of the agenda of sustainable cities. Uh, Mazda is trying to be car free. It has these little pods that are now being trialled. Um, but the final idea is that we do need electric vehicles. Even if we go down to 50% less car use, we still will have cars and they will need to be electric and run off the renewable power system. Uh, these are all rolling off the assembly line now and the interesting thing is that if we have electric vehicles and they are plugged in when they're not being used, they provide battery storage that can enable the city to be renewable. Now you can only do that if you've got a smart grid system. And smart grids, plug-in electric vehicles and renewables are now being called what our Al Gore says is the moonshot of a 100% renewable city. They are emerging, but public transport vehicles can be electric, uh, can, can be uh, plug-in electric. Uh, buses, even the new light rail are emerging uh, in this form. So that means the TODs need to be built as recharging places and they need to be fully green, fully renewable. We do need smart grids and we do need the uh, provide the infrastructure for storage. Um, we have a website on that if you want to go, go further into that. There is some activity on that front in Singapore. So a final word then. Um, Singapore is clearly a model in Asia and the world, really. Uh, I've been writing about Singapore for a long time, uh, about its polycentric structure being built around rail, and it does need to uh, continue that process. I don't think you need convincing that that works. Um, the transit services, it's always a matter of catch-up. You can't relax for a moment. It has to keep being built. The MRT extensions, more bus services at stations. You need a pedestrian and bicycle strategy. Uh, they are a constant struggle. You need a renewable transport strategy to make the best of this uh, plug-in electric vehicle, smart grid, renewable energy link. Uh, you can't be complacent about sustainable transport. It's a constant process to win. But uh, at least you have the base to work from that so many other cities don't. Thanks very much. There will be time for questions, I'm sure there are lots of them, but uh, first I want to invite uh, Dr. Paul Barton to come and give his comments. Um, Paul is assistant professor in the LKY School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore where he teaches on infrastructure policy, <coughs> urban policy, and transport policy. His published research is focused on various dimensions of the interactions between urban transport policy and urban policy more widely. Geographically, um, his work has tended to focus on Eastern Asia, with a particular focus on Malaysia and Singapore. And so he's very well qualified, I think, to be a local commentator on um, Peter's uh, paper. Paul's current research focuses on in innovation in transport demand management and the contested fundamental priorities of urban transport policy. Paul Barton. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you also to Ari uh, for graciously inviting me to, to be this to play this role. And thank you, Peter, for, for mentioning me several times. The uh, the role that I was given here was to be the local commentator to uh, 
give you some more additional insight on how these themes play out in Singapore. But having heard Peter and uh, his, he's actually done that very well, right? He's given you a lot of insight on where Singapore stands on these issues. Additionally, I'm sure in the audience there's a lot of expertise and enthusiasm about these issues. So I'll try to do something just slightly different from, uh, from that. What I'll do is, um, if you're anything like me, you're, you're having seen all of these inspiring ideas, uh, examples from, from both Singapore and other places on green urbanism, you're wondering, what can I do? How can I help? At least I hope some of you are. And, um, how do the processes that we see in, in these various cities come about? How is it that some cities launch into these issues? How do they make them happen? Where did that come from? I want to reflect a little bit on that question. And I'll get at the end to that question of what can I do to help? So how do societies make choices when they're faced with challenges and dilemmas on, on any kind of an issue, how do we make choices as a group as opposed to individual choices? How do groups make choices? One way to look at it is that there are three, three broadly speaking ways, three, three different approaches to making choices. One of them is uh, technical planning. And if, if we look, look at the landscape outside, Singapore is clearly a, a place with a lot of excellent technical planning. The government here prides itself on making decisions based on careful analysis. And we have a very capable civil service capable of doing analysis. A second way that societies make choices and face up to challenges is markets. Private initiative. When faced with a challenge, we see a price signal. Scarcity makes prices go up. Private initiative, the profit motive, prompts innovation, competition prompts innovation. And markets, for certain kinds of challenges, markets work very well. Of course, we need to shape markets, make sure they don't fail, as we can see in the last few years, that markets can fail spectacularly. But in a certain category of choices and dilemmas, challenges, markets work very well. And thirdly, perhaps most obviously, is politics, deliberation. Collectively, we talk it over, we make a collective choice, maybe through voting, maybe through consensus, arguing it out. In small groups, it's more likely to be, likely to be a consensus and arguing things through. Big groups might have to vote. I'm inspired to, to present these three frameworks, technical planning, markets, and and politics by uh, several other people. It's not, it's not my own framework exactly. So Deborah Stone, uh, who's a professor in political science in Dartmouth in the US, wrote a wonderful book. I'd really recommend it to you. It's called The Policy P Paradox. Her argument is that too much, of, um, too much emphasis on markets in public policy discussion, that markets being always the solution, she said, we've forgotten the polis. This is quite appropriate, this word polis. What she means by that is deliberation, politics, collective decision-making, vision. Uh, don't forget the polis. That's most appropriate in Singapore because ancient Greek, the word polis, what does it mean? Any smart, smart Alex in the, in the audience know polis? City-state. Testing your ancient Greek, not, not part of the Greek one here, I'm afraid. So, city-state. We are in the, the, the world's most uh, prominent city-state. There's not too many city-states in the world these days. Ancient Greece was full of them, uh, but Singapore is the, the most prominent city-state. So don't forget the polis. Mildred Warner, who's a, a scholar at Cornell University, gives something like a three-way framework. She extends Deborah Stone's framework just a little bit. So she talks about uh, technical planning, markets, and deliberation. But she was mainly talking about services, public services like infrastructure, sewers, that kind of thing. So what I'm doing is applying Mildred Warner's framework, which was inspired in turn by Deborah Stone's point. I'm applying that to green urbanism and, and get, asking us to reflect 
for all of the wonderful examples Peter gave of uh, initiatives different cities are making, and including Singapore as well, and some of the dilemmas that we are facing. Maybe, maybe some of you came along today feeling passionate about one of the themes in green, green urbanism or, or green urbanism in general, and you're here thinking, well, I want ideas. How can I make a difference? I want to apply this three-way framework and ask ourselves, how do we apply it to green urbanism frameworks? Can we reflect a little bit on how Singapore makes these decisions as a society? And then I'll give one or two urban transport examples and then end by asking what can you, can you do, what does it imply about what you can do. And then we'll go to questions because, as I said, there's so much expertise and interest in the audience. One, one question is, do we have the right balance between these three ways of making decisions? Whenever, we've, whenever we as a society are faced with a choice, we'll often set the markets to work. That, that's the, perhaps the default thing in public policy would be. If, if a market can work, by all means make it work. Don't interfere if you don't have to. The second thing is technical planning. And uh, engineers especially, technical planning and engineering, and urban planners are always very keen to jump in and plan. They have to be held back if, if necessary sometimes because you just can't stop them jumping in and planning everything. Uh, the economists and the planners have a bit of a fight. Should we have more markets? Should we have more planning? And that's where, that's where Deborah Stone's book comes in. She was engaging in that debate between the economists and the But it's, it's, the, it's the political deliberation that often gets forgotten. And I guess it's no great secret that perhaps we could say Singapore, tend, that tends not to be Singapore's strong point. The, the public deliberation over issues, collective decision making, that's not technical planning and it's not using market forces. But let, let's, let's keep that question in mind. Can we do better than that? Uh, how does Singapore do on that? A few examples um, in, in my arena, urban transport. The, the, the LTA, the Land Transport Authority, is uh, well underway planning a new north-south expressway. Now we saw that Singapore doesn't have an excessive amount of expressways by world standards on a per-person basis. But in a place like Singapore, if you build more road capacity, you're basically planning more traffic. The traffic is, is determined more or less by how much road space we have. Um, we can't, with the current road network, we can't have much more traffic. If we have one more huge great expressway to the north, we will get one more huge expressway's worth of traffic. Now that decision, maybe you, you can't remember hearing about that decision. In most cities, a big expressway would be something that you would you would have heard a lot of debate about it. You might have even seen people lying in front of bulldozers or waving placards in front of uh, the LTA offices. So it would be something that would be very vigorously debated. So there's a little, we're a little bit weak on these kind of big decisions that have been thoroughly debated in public. The LTA announces that a few weeks later bulldozers start to move. Uh, that's often how it works. Where's the marketing in that kind of thing? Well, the LTA in its technical planning takes account of people making decisions based on prices, based on private preferences. People like to drive cars, despite, despite uh, high prices. Um, the land market, the way what gets built where is very much uh, a market phenomenon combined with a planned if we look out the window, you'll see a lot of examples of uh, planning, URA visions. You'll also see a lot of examples of the market part of work. It may not be quite so obvious that deliberation politics is expressed in the Singapore landscape. And, and I, up till now, I've given perhaps a, a rather gloomy view that we're not very good at that. We haven't done enough of having debates. But, Remember, I'm, I'm zeroing in on this question, what can you do? And um, inspired by Peter, who's a great optimist and a very positive person, 
Um, I want to leave you with a, with a positive theme, which is actually that it's not as gloomy as I perhaps have hinted at at the beginning. I've, I've hinted that there's not much that you can do, that it's all technical planning and the market and the government decides in combination with market forces. But on many of the exciting things that Singapore is doing in green urbanism, if you happen to know the inside story, you will know that activists actually made a difference in many of those examples. One very obvious example is Chek Jawa on Pulau was saved at least temporarily, but I believe it, it probably is safe for good because I can't believe the government would change their mind now. It was activists that made that happen. You may not hear the, the government saying that. They may not get medals or ribbons or highlighted in the media for it, but anyone who knows the inside story of Chet Jawa knows that a very, very dedicated group of people pushed very hard in a non-confrontational Singaporean way, but they pushed very hard. There's a lot of discussion about the role of bicycles in Singapore's urban transport, and this is very much a green urbanism thing. It's a difficult thing. It's, it's not something that's easy to solve. Singaporeans and Singapore residents are voting with their pedals and their feet by riding bicycles more and more. But because we haven't done enough technical planning of bicycle infrastructure in Singapore so far, this market phenomenon of more bicycle use is causing a nuisance because we didn't plan well enough. And then it's also, this nuisance provokes politics. We find people riding to the forum. Those pesky bicycles nearly knocked over my old my grandmother last week, and I'm very upset. Or I'm a cyclist, and I'm upset that this terribly inconsiderate motorist cut me off and uh, nearly killed me, etc. Right? So it all goes different ways. That's actually becoming quite public now. And you would have seen the government is responding by announcing in, uh, initiatives. In my view, they're not anywhere near enough just yet. But it's, it's a sign of response. Behind the scenes for a long time, well before you would have, would have ever seen it in the newspaper, a dedicated group of people has been pushing. And so activism, which you might think of as a dirty word in Singapore, and you might think the government doesn't welcome activism and it actively discourages it. Not quite. It's not so simple. The government very much does respond to ordinary people, people with some interest, people with a passion, making their views known. Don't be afraid. If you care about green urbanism, you can make a difference. Even if you're not a market mover, you're not city, city, uh, city land or um, any of the big market players, it, it doesn't matter. You're not, it doesn't have to be through market forces. Even if you're not a technical expert, okay, so you can't have an influence on the technical planning side, play your part in the polis by all means. And here we are in the polis, the city-state of Singapore. So that's where I'll end. Hopefully that's emboldened you to ask questions and, uh, and comment. And, uh, so thank you very much.